in Cornelius read the book The Free Voice. He talks on page 98 about the seven most common physical arrangements of registration or of singers or of students or of, of anybody. Um, and I'm always listening for, for these things when I hear new students or um, when I'm you know, hearing students every single week if they've been studying with me for years or just for weeks. Um, we're trying to move up this kind of pecking order of, or these arrangements that he talks about. But let's just, let's go through them. Number one, a state of perfect coordination where both registers have been fully developed and smoothly joined. This occurs but rarely. So he's talking about coordination between registers, chest register and head voice register. Um, you can do anything you want if your head voice and chest voice registered are, um, are joined smoothly. You can do anything you want. You can express yourself. You can ha find the most of your range. You can sing opera. You can sing jazz. You could be Whitney Houston. You could be, you know, Franco Corelli. Um, yeah, this occurs but rarely. Number two, a divided registration whose action is dominated by the upper register or head voice. And I find that these are the people that can sing, I would say like Jeff Buckley um, and people who have seemingly no upper limit to their, their voice. Like you, you can just sing as high as you want. There's no limit. It's incredible. I've, I've been around these people and I'm in awe of them all the time. I am... I feel like that is not me. I'm more of a chest voice dominant person, so, um, and I, I think that's a little more common for, for low voices, for basses. But um, this is, I think, um, from the way we speak. Like, if you're always like, hey, how's it going? My name's Josh, and I speak in my head voice, and this is how I talk all day long. Um, uh, that's more of a head voice dominant sound. Or if maybe if you were in choir and you got one of the lucky ones and you were a, a tenor or a soprano in choir, but you learned how to do it the right way, and so you practice that for hours and hours and hours your whole life. Um, that's number two, head voice dominant. A div uh, number three, a divided registration whose action is dominated by the lower register or chest voice. I feel like that's more, more me or more basses or people that kind of maybe struggle with high notes at some point in their life. Um, their low notes are big and round and strong and powerful, um, but maybe their head voice is not as strong. So we're having a hard time kind of going over the passaggio or the passageway up to the high, higher register. Um, you know, some, some belty, very belty singers, um, I feel like most like Broadway belters are, are more like this. Um, now, if you've gotten to Broadway or if you're Adele, you obviously have, um, are probably closer to that like, you know, m more equal uh, chest and head, head state. Um, but yeah, uh, number four, a condition where both registers are used but with an audible gap separating them. In this arrangement, the registers are often so widely separated as to prohibit free passage from one to the other. This makes singing difficult, if not impossible. If the gap is narrow, the technique is ready to move on to either one of the two higher categories, chest or head. Of all the categories listed, this is the broadest and within it, the technical status of the singer can be anywhere from the primitive to the fairly advanced, right? So if, um, I, I see this a lot with, with younger singers. Um, actually, let me take that back because um, I see it in, in uh, older students too. But predominantly um, in people whose voice have just changed or um, just gone through that voice change, uh, there's, a, there's a pretty audible gap in that. So you, your chest register goes up pretty high and then there's like a couple note gap where there's just very breathy tones. And then up above it, um, it's, you know, you could be an octave above it. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and then the voice comes back into a pretty big power. Um, what he's talking about, this is, you know, the, the, if the gap is narrow, the technique is ready to move in. So you can work on building the muscles down in head voice and, and strengthening those notes. Um, I don't necessarily think anymore that, well, it depends on the singer, but 
if your chest voice is really strong, I wouldn't keep pushing that up. You know, we kind of have to balance that out a little bit more. So um, as you can see, almost everything involves a balance registration and we need to um, exercise both registers independently um, and then work at combining them, of course. Number five, a condition where the falsetto or head voice is used alone while the lower register is excluded entirely from discernible participation. This situation is not likely to be encountered with the male voice. Um, so when I, I see students, sometimes then they're like, I really just want to get um, my chest voice much stronger. I'll see this situation. So um, head, vo uh, head voice or, or falsetto is, is all the way down like, Usually, you know, with um, females or um, younger people, the, the lowest note is like A or A flat below middle C. And so if the chest voice is not really involved, that'll be a hard stop there. You can't really get much lower than that. But if we've got like a brassy chest voice, it'll definitely get lower than that and there'll be much more power. But so this is an interesting um, symptom, this number five, where the head voice is used totally alone. Again, solution here, provide um, a slow and steady and positive um, environment in which the chest voice can be um, exercised and brought into the voice. Glasses back on. Number six, a condition where the chest register is used exclusively while the head register is neglected. A condition common to the male voice, less so for the female unless they're belting out popular songs. Now I do see this a lot where the head register is neglected, especially with like uh, female belters, where it'll, I mean if, in my experience, if the, if the head voice is not joined, you know, within a reasonable amount of time, it, it can be very weak for a long, long time. So it, I always work with my younger students to, um, to put in a lot of work on that head, head register, especially if they're just belting all the time. Um, with guys, uh, especially with the, the, um, the voice uh, change, that head voice, I don't know, it's, it's very psychological, right? Who wants to go like, ooh, you know, <laughs> unless you're in this, the safe space in uh, a singing studio. Um, but it's hard to even practice that, you know, um, s in a society, uh, that ooh sound, that hooty falsetto -y sound. So, you know, uh, again, I go back to one of these concepts where um, the don't be afraid to let go. One must be able to let go and practice both of these registers, which in and of themselves are, uh, are pretty aesthetically unpleasing or in a fancy way of saying kind of weird or brash or ugly or, or strange sounding. So we have to be willing to let go and um, not be bound by a rigid attitude toward tone quality, as Cornelius says here. All right, here we are with number seven. An improper blending or mix of the registers in which they have been smoothly joined in the wrong balance. This introduces muscular conflicts which can never be resolved without disengaging the registration. Sometimes this is done, I'm getting very dark here. Um, let me open the window. Okay, sorry for the light change. It's gonna be okay. Um, sometimes this can be done, but often one fault will cancel out the other so that in the correcting the reg registration, for example, an approach will have to be made which will worsen the resonance adjustment. What makes it really hopeless is that the work done to improve the resonance adjustment undermines the efficiency of the registration. There is no solution to this problem. There are certain mixtures, however, notably those heard with the lyric tenor referred to as the bel canto type, which are functional to a degree. In, gen in general, lyric tenors are extremely limited technically. Okay, um, we're getting bright again. Let me turn this. Um, so this is a hard one to hear. He's saying that there's no hope. And, um, you know, maybe there's no hope for, you know, if you want to be a professional opera singer, but there are many pegs and holes in which we can get into. Um, if you want to be a character tenor, that could be totally what he's talking about right here. Um, if you want to be, you know, um, yeah, a, car a, caric a caricature, a caricature, a character. Um, but you know what I see often is that this kind of mixture is, is, can sometimes be a very pleasant thing. And if you 
you know, want to sing and you're in a band and you sing this way, um, that's okay. It doesn't, you know, I, we're here, voice teachers are here to let you live your best life and your best singing life. So what I see is that if there are um, symptoms of, you know, vocal problems that are audible to others, like you sing off pitch, uh, there's a wobble or a tremolo or there's constriction or you can't sing high or you can't sing low. Those are the things to really work on. But sometimes I hear this kind of like mixture where, you know, you can maybe the, the voice is upside down. The head voice is a little, you know, is too low and the chest voice is too high. Um, it's not always the end of the world. So have no fear. I think this is, you know, maybe meant for like the conservatory student or the you know the pre-professional that um, you know wants to make it on you know the metropolitan opera stage and they keep getting beat out because their voice is too small or too soft or too low um, there are many many ways to enjoy your voice uh, you know with a band rock and roll um, all sorts of things and um, you know, working on the voice is something that I've really devoted my whole life to, and it's a worthy goal, and it's a, a great thing. It's infinite. There's really no end. Um, and so if you find, uh, you know, this is, I, I just find this stuff really fascinating because it's, it's defining something that is seemingly very subjective and um, cloudy. It's giving some objectivity to this. So, um, that's why I like to talk about it. That's why I like to use this to diagnose my students or to think about how to approach students. And I think it's very helpful for, for teachers. So um, I'd love to hear your comments on this. Uh, let's, keep, let's keep an open discourse. Thanks.